As we pick up the gospel story according to Matthew, Jesus has just heard about the beheading and death of John the Baptist, news that would have rocked his world. And then immediately he had to go and feed thousands of people who gathered with him and his closest followers beside the sea, a miracle of loaves and fish, grace abounding. Hear now what the Spirit may say. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead on to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you in the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, came toward Jesus, but when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, and the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. It's good to come home. You may know that I was away for some time of study leave and vacation. It began with a week at the St. John's Abbey out in Minnesota. I went longing for a bit of peace and quiet and restoration and centeredness. Life and ministry over the past year here among you has been far from a stormy crisis, friends, but still at times maybe I felt something like the disciples rowing hard and long, straining against winds and waves. I wonder what experience might come to your heart and mind as you hear these words of Scripture this day. Like Jesus going up a mountain to pray, we all need rest, rejuvenation, renewed inspiration. I never stayed at a Catholic abbey before. How would I be received? When I arrived, Brother Aiden, Brother Aiden welcomed me and I asked him how I should go about campus, where I should go, what was off limits. Would I be able to share communion in worship? Except for the small cloister area, I had the run of the entire college campus. He especially encouraged me to visit the craftsmen in the wood shop, and he welcomed me to share communion. But just to be sure, admittedly skeptical, I asked another brother, Jim. Oh yes, he flashed a rebellious smile. We Benedictines, we kind of go our own way sometimes. It's beautiful when unfamiliar places and people quickly begin to feel a bit like home. I'm finally grateful for my time there reading and worshiping and cycling and chatting with various brothers and people I met. My tired, distracted little faith met the presence of Christ, something like what I hope we might share, friends, here, what we might offer to anyone who comes among us. Brother Jim, Brother Jim proved very friendly and attentive and very talkative. He happily invited me to become an oblate of their abbey. It's sort of like being a monk without actually living there. I said, well, I'll have to talk it over with Suzanne, my wife. (laughs) Oh, she can become an oblate too, he encouraged. When I told her, Suzanne just smiled and she didn't need to say anymore. With all of you jokingly greeting me with welcome visitor or glad you made it back or something like that, you don't need to be concerned about my intentions, dear friends. 
There's a feeling like we're at home, and then there's home. Home. Where we're safe and accepted just as we are with all of our idiosyncrasies and no need for pretension. Home. With people who love us and whom we love in return without conditions and beyond any limitations. Home. A shelter in storms that blow through our personal lives and society around where we share difficult conversations and from, from where we venture forth again on the seas of service with hope, with confidence, with courage, with peace. After my time in Minnesota, our family went on a cruise to Alaska. We didn't face anything like gale force wind and waves, as Matthew says, the disciples did in their little fishing boat. Some sun, 60s, little rain, nearly perfect weather, until storms roiled our stomachs <laughs> about a day after leaving the ship. Suzanne and Ailey had already gone back home to work. It was the night before we expected to have our mountaintop experience at Denali. First, Nathaniel lost his Subway sandwich. I phoned the front desk. This poor guy came with a, with a few rags and a spray bottle. He took a brief look and... He left again, sparing you the details. About an hour later, I mostly suppressed laughter when three people showed up with hazmat gowns from head to duct tape shoes and gloves and masks and goggles. Even Nathaniel cracked a smile through his misery. And when I joined him on those stormy seas a few hours later, I tried to make sure staff didn't, didn't need to dress for another alien encounter. But as we lay in the hotel beds that day and next, as we received special treatment, that is, a special transport from Denali to Fairbanks, that is, really, quarantine, over roads as wavy and bumpy as the Galilee Sea probably was, there was a strong longing that rose in my heart for home. Perhaps you know what I mean. Maybe our longing that night pales in comparison to your storms or to others whom we know, the chemo and radiation and weeks of rehab, the months of searching for a job, the nights lying awake wondering how did our relationship become so conflicted and distant, years struggling with the grip of addiction or homelessness or hunger, venom and condemnation that can even be heard in places like this, incessant fear and anxiety fueled on TV and radio and Facebook wherever we get our news, like the vitriol and violence from Charlottesville yesterday. Longing, longing for home and God's grace and peace where all people are loved and healed and share abundant life. I suppose if stormy seas could blow through even a hilly, a hilly wilderness and a dry pit, that's what rocked Joseph's world. He wasn't feeling much love from his brothers. Truth be told, he didn't give it much either. Some might say he got what was coming to him after flaunting his privileged favor in Daddy Jacob's eyes like that special coat. Every word clothed him with an attitude far more haughty than humility. Sometimes storm clouds in life form from our own hot air and the condensation of all of our own transgressions. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who redeems my life from the pit. Joseph might come to sing that refrain years later after he languishes in an Egyptian prison and then rises to be Pharaoh's right-hand man when his dream comes true. But we'll get to that part of the story next week. For now, he's caught in a serious tempest like Jesus' disciples or maybe it's more like his brothers just throw him overboard, out of the family boat, sink or swim, no life jacket for you. As Matthew tells the story, Jesus and the disciples are as far apart as a mountaintop and some distant sea level. A bumper sticker on their boat reads, no Jesus, no peace. Waves batter the boat, they splash over the side. Wind rips open their cloaks, soaks them to the bone. The news, the diagnosis buffets our minds. Question and uncertainty pelts us like driving rain. Frustration and fear soak into our hearts. Waves of loss and loneliness, hopelessness threaten to swamp us. It's late at night, there's no land in sight. 
And friends, we know what storms can do to even the biggest Edmund Fitzgerald ocean tankers. If we don't, just ask any one of the many sailors among us who've seen how quickly a storm can blow up on the Great Lakes as on Galilee long ago. At men's group this past week, guys mentioned how one day recently there were 10-foot waves rolling on Lake Michigan. Sometimes we can forecast how long the stormy conditions will last. Guys said apparently that's what made many Chicago to Mackinac racers buffeted by the waves turn back this year. We try to make plans for our journey based upon the reports we receive. We analyze predictions. We responsibly, especially we Presbyterians, we responsibly make our decisions. Sometimes, despite our best calculations and intentions, winds shift suddenly. Waves begin to rise, and we just have to make it through best we can, looking for any safe port, any, any calm inlet, any big rock to shelter behind and ride out the storm. The disciples strained at the oars, no land in sight. Maybe they were concerned, or maybe as experienced fishers of the sea, they thought, been here, done this, it's going to be rough, but we're far from the shore for the moment, but, but we'll get there. Clearly, they weren't lounging through a peaceful sail under a beautiful moon and stars with a gentle breeze at their backs. But Matthew doesn't say that they were terrified until they see Jesus. Until they see Jesus coming toward them, walking on water, coming in a way beyond anything that they know is possible. This is their leader. This is their companion as they've never known him before. Now, friends, Matthew is not trying to get us marvel at Jesus' circus stunt ability, something like Cirque du Soleil at sea. How we experience God in this life and the teaching and the way that Jesus empowers, this is what he's trying to get us to see, to believe this, this living resurrection faith. You see, all the good news to whom all the good Jews to whom Matthew told the good news would remember the Hebrew scriptures about when God brings life out of stormy chaos as the, star, as the spirit moved water over the watery void at creation or in the story of Noah's flood and the exodus through the Red Sea and the crossing through the Jordan River into their longed-for promised land. Job's proclamation would have rung in their hearts, God tramples on the wave. the great I am, the power of God's love surpasses any other force, any other circumstance in all the universe. That's what we believe when we cry, bless the Lord, O my soul. Because you see, friends, here's the good news. Jesus came to the disciples through the storm of chaos he was unhindered by the gale winds that buffeted and battered their little boat. Trust that our risen Lord comes to us with love, with peace, with a way forward when stormy chaos soaks and sickens and threatens to sink us. Now, good news, though, is not always easy to accept. Like the disciples, it can, be un and it can be unnerving when experiences of divine grace don't fit our conceptions of reality or faith in the past. It can be alarming when revelations of love and healing and visions for abundant life together as Jesus embodied go beyond what we believe is possible and good and right and true. Sometimes, if we're honest, we need to change our opinions and expectations about about people that we've met, or places, or what should be done. No doubt, faith is not always easy and straightforward and predictable and comfortable. God's Spirit can be unsettling. Jesus can be scary. That's what got him crucified. To really see him, to really trust in the resurrection, we must be willing to have assumptions challenged and preconceptions changed. We must be willing in the end to live differently. 
Take heart, have courage, Jesus says, do not be afraid. So good old Peter, who's always willing to try something new, he casts out all caution into those winds. He steps out into something he hasn't calculated securely. There's no committee that's met. Peter's probably not Presbyterian in this instance. They may even defy all but holy devotion. And the way we live faith will depend, friends, on how we understand Jesus responds when Peter begins to sink. The way that we live our own faith will depend on how we hear Jesus, his voice, when he responds, when Peter begins to sink, because friends, no surprise, we're gonna sink too. God wants us to keep the eyes of our hearts focused on Jesus, to center our hearts and minds, all that we say and do in the way of compassion, the truth of love, the life of sacrificial service that he embodies, and inevitably, we too, We'll have times when our attention turns more to stormy winds that blow the tweets, the news feeds, the words that someone said, the conflict so close to home, the anger or fear in our hearts, the self-doubt, the tiredness that clouds our heads. And when we do, that's when we'll sink into the chaos, overwhelmed by waves of all that's wrong, losing sight of what is right. Lord, save me, we cry, precious Lord, take my hand. And when Jesus gets hold of us, we hear no echo of Peter being chastised. Jesus doesn't chide for trying to do what he does. Jesus doesn't scold and tell us to just remain in the boat. Friends, hear the patient compassion in his voice, the encouragement and affirmation with, with no condemnation, like a mother who will not forsake a nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home. You of little faith, why did you doubt? It's not a squelching of healthy questions. It's more like, why did your heart Quaver, why did your trust waver? More than stressing failure, Jesus tries to help us see, each of us, how much more is possible. I love how Henry Nouwen expresses it in a book that I read at St. John's Abbey. As Jesus travels with us in life, he teaches us how to return to the house of love. It's far from easy. We panic when looking at the impossible task, the powerful waves, the heavy winds, the roaring storm. Jesus is a very patient teacher. He never stops telling us where to make our true home, what to look for, and how to live. Jesus never stops telling us and showing us even when sometimes we stop listening and looking. You know, friends, after time at the abbey and then lying in bed sick longing for home I realized that amid all the wonders and the beauties the goodness the ways a cruise can make you feel at home I really missed routines of prayer and simply being with God my little faith had wavered again amid all the daily delights of activity and scenery it's my fault, if there's any to confess. I could have done it. I even brought my little daily prayer book with me. I just didn't do it. And now, after weeks away, here I am again with you in worship. Most of you are still sitting in the same seats, though a couple of you have changed. <laughs> we hear the beautiful choir. We have a beautiful new pianist to share a prelude. And I'm home. I'm grateful for the break, and I hope that we all find times to get away, moments each day, if not a, a special journey for prayer and renewal or whatever we might say. We all need times to be with God, who is, of course, always with us. And, and dear friends, as I've come back this week, I realize I cherish. I am grateful to be in this great big boat with all of you. I lament a few friends of ours who are moving away soon, 
or over the past year have found it difficult to feel at home here anymore. I am home, and I dearly desire that all people who might wish it would find a way here to come home with God in Jesus Christ. I came home as we shared with the Associate Pastor Nominating Committee a celebratory meal and final preparation for Chrissy to begin with us this coming week. We talked about palpable ways that we felt the Spirit move and clear outcomes that are far more God's grace than our intentions and actions. I came home with God in a room where about 10 or 12 of us gathered at noon on Tuesday to talk about holy love amidst all of our everyday life. Laughter, good questions, past experiences rising up in waves just beneath the surface, some blessed, some very difficult. I came home with a young man who's trying to find a way step by step on life's journey through questions of faith and experience and love for a life partner. And with all those other men on Wednesday night, a little farther along on their walk on the water, probably still asking many of those same questions. I came home to the bedside of a saint a long-time member who has begun her final journey of this life into eternity, surrounded as she was with pictures and other decor of a long life and bonds of love that even make a hospice room a home. And as I talked with her, God's Spirit revealed again so clearly that relationships in love, as, Je as Jesus shows us, make any place, from a lonely boat to a cozy house to a soaring sanctuary, home. I could go on and on, and thanks be to God that we will in this sanctuary in the city together, this great big lifeboat for all who might need it, ever stepping out toward new revelations of holy love, ever striding in new directions of sacred grace through the stormy winds and waves that blow, like in the wake of Charlottesville or bearing in heart and mind and prayer the family and friends of Joseph Sablon back home in Guam. Like all the ways that God calls us to proclaim Jesus' vision of home in our world, against hate and prejudice, even loving enemies, pursuing abundant life as God wants it for all people and all creation in the fullness of grace, and mercy and peace. So starting tomorrow, friends, we'll welcome Chrissy Westbury and her family home among us. As we would anyone who may wander in here among us. And on Thursday night, we'll share a potluck dinner with the Zamel family, the Syrian refugees that we have welcomed here to Kalamazoo, and every day God calls us to continue going through the storms of life to people just like us who are crying out, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Help me stand. When they got into the boat, Matthew writes, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, and they said, Truly, you are the Son of God. More than biological explanations or metaphysical descriptions, it's a whisper, humbly. It's a confident declaration. It's a bold shout of devotion. It's a song of faith that moves us from fear to trust in the one who promises, I will come to you. Do not be afraid, I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me. I will bring you home. I love you and you are mine. Thanks be to God. Amen.